Heather McDonald has got the juices scoop. When you're on the road, when you're on the go, Juicy Scoop is the show to know. She talks Hollywood tales, her real life Mr. Segment, serial data, and serial sister. You'll be addicted and addicted fast to the number one tabloid real life podcast. Listen in, listen up. Woo woo. Heather McDonald. Juicy Scoop. Hello and welcome to Juicy Scoop. As promised, we had a couple more juicy topics and things that we want right. to discuss, so I'm back here with the hilarious Chris Frangiola. Well, I want to discuss with you uh, an article I just read before I came over. Yes. That uh, about guilt tipping. People believe guilt tipping is getting out of control. You know, that every everywhere you go now, no matter what it is, whether you get a, a lot done or nothing done, it'll pop up however, what percentage you want to leave. Right. And there is a guilt guilt factor to it you know like oh i gotta leave something and i want to be that guy exactly so, and they make it so easy right because so many of these places now are no cash they don't even allow no it cash. Many so you them. really don't feel it yeah when you put in the card and then they go oh we spin it around the ipad and they're like it's going to ask you a question and i'm mm -hmm. like i think i know what the question is yeah and you and know, they look away like yeah you know, and then no some pressure. of these like at starbucks it's one, two, or custom, or whatever it is. One dollar, two dollar, something custom. Yeah. Which I think is pretty classy of Starbucks. Now, there's other ones that are literally 20, it starts 20%, 25%, and 35%. Yeah. And it's like a smoothie. I know. And it's just like a hard thing because I'm like, look, I know food and all this stuff is more expensive. I don't want everyone to be replaced by a robot. Right. So you're like, okay. But then as you like leave, you're like, this fucking smoothie was like twenty two dollars. Yeah, it's crazy. And then you're just like, I don't I don't care that, you know, how well I'm doing. Like there's a part of you that's just like, I shouldn't be spending this much right. on this sad salad. I know. Or whatever. I was at a concert <laughs> a couple of weeks ago and I went and bought a concert shirt and like two things. And whatever, that's expensive already. So it was like $150 for two right. shirt. And then it's at, at the end it says 20%, 25 or 30%, or whatever. But you have to hit something. So I'm like, I mean, so on a 25% on a hundred, that's like f f whatever, $20 or something on Did you do it? Yes. For like the guy to hand me the shirt. Yeah, that's I mean, I get it. I was a tipped employee for a long time. Yes. So I'm not gonna say don't tip, but yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is a lot. How do you feel about Uber and Lyft? I tip, you got to tip on that yeah. one. I feel like they're doing a lot. I do too. You know, it, sometimes it's a little hard because like if it's a really expensive one. Yeah. You're like, eh, I already paid like 120. I know. But here's the thing. Do, they so they, they got to drive back. I know. Right. No, so I, I mean, I weird, do it. Yeah. I do the typical whatever. Yeah, you got to. Um, Uber and Lyft, waiters. And I always and, give them the five star. Yeah. Okay. Even if they weren't. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, they're going to figure it out. Right. Even if it was the worst one I've ever had and the guy didn't stop talking and the place smelled like B.O., Thank I'm you. still yeah. like five star. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Because I'm like, he knows where I live. Uh, yeah. So yeah, like, I don't need true. him to like have some weird thing. I always imagine like a weird movie of like where you have a really bad Uber experience. Not like they attacked you or anything, but like it wasn't good. Right. The guy was annoying. He talked. He didn't know his way around. Maybe he was on his phone looking and like yeah. not paying to the road. Even then I would do the tip and the five star because I like, so the guy gets fired from Uber or Lyft. And yeah. then because of that, his wife leaves him and everything. And he's mm -hmm. like, it's all because I lost my Lyft job. I want to find that bitch. And then he sets out to do got, little things. We got to ourselves make a lifetime go, movie here. Yeah, that do little things that make you go crazy. Right. And infiltrate all parts of your life, your personal relationship, your job, fucked up stuff, goes around your backyard and like, you yeah. know, turns your pool on and floods your whole backyard, whatever, just all these little things. And then she finds out it's because the tip she him. didn't yeah. tip him or whatever. <laughs> I like that. Somebody call Ian Ziering is the Lyft driver in this, in our lifetime movie, in my head. Who's the mom? The mom would be played by Joanna Kearns. <laughs> no, she no she's too old. She's too old. She's yeah. the, she would be the mother, yeah. and it would be Denise Richards. Ooh, yeah. I like that casting. Denise and Denise Richards, Richards is a oh, single. That's great. She's a single mom, and she just started dating. 
and she was coming back from a date, and, he, and but she didn't like the date, so she called an Uber to escape. And then Ian, Ian Ziering, who was cute underneath, but he's starting yeah. to look weird because he's mm-hmm. getting weird, is just getting out in the dating world and because his wife and he are like separated. Yeah. And he thinks they have a connection and she's like, listen, dude, stop talking to me. I don't want to be around you anymore. And then gets out of the car. This is excellent. And then she, you know, is like, I'm so sick of not speaking up. So she like tells Lyft, like this guy's weird. He gets fired. And then he's like, it's all because of that bitch. And she has no idea why her life is complete havoc. And then the final scene is she comes out of the shower and he's there. Yeah. And Ooh. he's like, I thought you said you didn't want to talk on your app. You said you wanted it to be silent because she'll be like, can't we just talk? Can't we just uh-huh. talk? Uh-huh. We just talk? Oh, I'm hanging on to the, I want to see how this ends. Does she kill him? Or? Of course. Oh, okay. Like fatal attraction. Yes, like of course. Him, she ends up killing falls him. Falls into the tub. And then, you know, the daughter comes home and hugs her yeah. and the police real, are the, there. The real and then, daughter. And then, and then, and then the, the Sheen daughter. She plays the part. Oh, if she can leave her bedroom from doing OnlyFans, she has to do one day on the set. She's like, when can I go home, yeah. mom? Um, wow. Well, there That's was something else you were going to talk about. Oh, the tattoo. Oh, we were just looking at, machine. we were looking at TMZ before we came to air. So he, so Machine Gun Kelly, I don't know if he's date, still with Machine Gun. No, it's Gun, hard to say what's Megan going on. Megan Kelly or whatever yeah. her name is. What's her name? Yeah. Uh, is it Megan Kelly? There is a Megan Kelly, but no, it's not. She's not dating Machine Gun Kelly. There's she's on. Wait, what is his girlfriend? Megan name? Fox. Megan Fox. Okay, yeah. so he he now he's doing the whole black thing. Yeah, he went completely. Which actually, black. Kat Von D has done a lot on. Like people are just going black on their arms. Full black. Yeah. Okay. Right. Ugh, I do not like that look. No. I'd much rather just stick with the original tattoos. Yeah, like a little dolphin on your ankle that you got. How much do you have to tip your tat guy? I'm sure you're a lot. That's a lot of work, I would imagine. I don't have any tattoos. I mean, you don't have any tattoos, right? No. Me neither. I wonder if they like the if they make you pay the before and then you tip them before because you're like, I don't, if you don't tip them, good luck with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. You're going to really fuck it, it up. Yeah. Yeah. Misspell it and shit. Barbara Corcoran of Shark Tank. Sure. Says she has a great marriage because she's 75. Yeah. But for the last 40 years of her marriage, so- It's a long time. I didn't realize they'd been married that, but he's her second husband. Right. Anyway, I don't know how long they did sleep in the same room together, but for the last 40 years, Mm -hmm. they've had full on separate bedrooms, not just like in the middle of the night, whatever, I want to watch some TV and I'm going to go to the guest room, like full separate bedrooms. And on occasion, they invite each other over, but- who knows how often they do. And she right. said, because he's messy and his shit's everywhere and she can't stand it. And this way she gets a lovely night's sleep. I mean, I honestly don't really have much of a problem with this. I feel like it's almost, I feel like more people should adopt this I feel uh, like lifestyle. it's a taboo subject and half the country is not admitting well, to Cameron it. Well, Cameron Diaz recently came out and said that she does the same thing. Her and Benji Madden sleep in separate bedrooms. I don't know how, how true it is, but she did say that they do it as well. And they're young, I mean, their marriage is not 35 years, but. So, I mean, I don't know. It feels. I think that people don't want to say it because everyone talks and they think you immediately must have a problem. But I know that there's like new houses being built and they do two primary masters. Really? Yeah. Like you can do that. Yeah. So that each house, each room and you cry, and you don't share the bath. You each have a beautiful bath. You each have your own closet. Yeah. And, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's a thing that only financially a lot of people can afford right. until their kids move out and maybe they can make another bedroom well, a comfortable situation so that the two people could sleep separately if they chose. We don't share the bath anymore. Um, I have a bathroom. My wife has a bathroom. that We never go into each other's bathrooms. It's uh, So yeah, I mean, but bedroom, yeah. yes, still. But also, here's a good one for those of you thinking about doing this. Here's a way to kind of get in it slowly. I do sleep in my daughter's room of some a lot not a lot but some so like, there's like a big bed in there yeah, along with where one of those bed? trundles and nothing oh, comes yeah. out the bottom and my daughter wants me to sleep in the trundle so i'll stay in there and kind of enjoy it and you just fall asleep fall there. asleep in there yeah. and then i'm in there for the night i'm like oh i'm not gonna get up now and oh, so that's i just good. stay in there yeah. so that kind of it doesn't look like i'm sleeping in another bedroom like i was with her so yeah yeah all right there you go i've solved everyone's problems i yeah i think it's um i think it's something that People like will hide too. Like if someone comes to your house, yeah, and you're like, "Oh, who's in here?" And you're like, "Right." You know, I don't know. Listen, 
we are. I like, feel like it's coming uh, becoming much more. We are acceptable. lucky enough to have extra rooms now. Yeah. with comfortable beds. And look, I'm going to say it before it comes out in a People article. We do sleep in separate beds often, not all the time, but often. How often? Now, which house? We have a, well. The Woodland Hills house is separate well, beds. The in the Woodland Hills house, we have a room that can always that has a comfortable bed with a good TV and everything. That's not the master. Okay. And then in the other house, um, not as often because it's not as many bedrooms, and oftentimes kids or guests are there. Is there a reason? Is it snoring? Is it sometimes it's like you just have different time schedules? Yeah, it's just you know, like, like I want to watch TV and. Till eleven, and you're in, you sleep go to sleep at nine. Yeah, and then he wakes up early, and then the dog like wants its food early, and he'll do the food for right. the dog. I don't know. I just think, I just think there's so much resentment that can be built up because someone is fucking with your sleep. Oh, absolutely. That I think a lot of marriages could probably not get divorced if they had room to sleep separately yeah, and have that separate time. And whether it's a woman who gets up and pees a lot and then <laughs> the guy's mad that she's peeing or right. the guy's snoring and disrupting her. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I'm all for it. You got no problem with um, it. I just liked this for you because it said Bianca um, Sensori is in revealing outfit with Kanye West at the Cheesecake Factory. They are loving- They love the Cheesecake Factory. The Cheesecake Factory. I know. And I, I, I'm trying to figure out, I think they go to the one in Beverly Hills. There's a couple of, I mean, there's a particularly nice one here in Woodland Hills, yeah, right well, in the, in I, the I, mall. I, 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 yeah. They must be going there because this place is still in Hidden Hills, I think. I thought so. But it, then I saw pictures that it was not that one. I'm very familiar with that one. Yeah. And it's not that one. And then there's a, you know, it's a, I know the ones in this area. So I think they're in Talking Beverly Hills Talking about it right now, I'm like pretty hungry for lunch. It's great. I freaking love cheese. And I love their skinny menu. Yeah, the skinny so menu. Good. Anyway, her nips are out. Her vag is out. Yeah, Other she's Other times she puts on a jacket. We still don't know what the deal is. And did you see the video of her talking and everyone was shot? Like that, oh, wait, before her voice. she met yeah, him before she and met she him. was like- She was doing like a real estate commercial or no, design. She's she an was talking about design. But she's an architect of fashion design, which I never knew even existed. She yeah. says she's an architect, but she's not an architect like building a home. No. It's very, yeah. but she, and she's Australian. Yes. But anyway, it was interesting to hear her voice, but it is so yeah. funny that we just haven't heard her voice that her, you know, yeah, so and you're like, weird. what is it? She's yeah, yeah. like intelligent. Right. And so Brad Pitt is finally just going to stop trying to fight for the custody. He's still going to see the kids, but this divorce has gone on so long and so ugly. I know. With their six kids and the winery. And I'm like, literally, I started to read this article. I'm like, this is Perez put it out. And, um, I was like, wait a minute, are any even under 18 anymore? And there's, no, they're all I think, like only the twins. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I even think Shiloh is like very close, if not there at eight, right. almost 18. The other girl, Sahara, is in, in college. Yeah. The boys are in their 20s. Right. And so it's like, I think it finally just ran out of time. Yeah. Also, when they were met, like when they got divorced, everyone thought, oh, this would be like an amicable one. They both seem normal. Ish, you know what I mean? That oh, would, it but was it, vicious. But I know, but I don't think they let it get as vicious because they're both big stars, and p there's probably like, don't you drag I Brad, Brad Pitt's a big the, star. Well, the, there it was vicious. Like it's it nothing was, that it was that he was drunk and got physical with some either she or Maddox or both on the private plane. That is the story that came out. Right. That was what made her file. Yeah, and then he was like, "That's not true," and then like Maddox. I don't know if he was over 18 or not, but like, was he going to tell? And, you know, Maddox was with her before they ever got together. So right. I think his loyalty to his mom and probably just like, you're a drunk dick. Then he got sober. Then she like sold the winery from underneath him. Yeah. Anyway, I mean. And then also, I don't know, like, what has she done lately? I feel like we have, I think her whole thing is she is so into being a mom. I think after this whole thing with him happened, she was just like, that's it. I'm focusing on being a mom. Yeah. Once the twins go off to college or whatever they do at 18, then we're going to see her like start acting and doing more stuff. That's what I think. This is my, my theory on all uh, actresses of a certain era 
especially very attractive ones like Annalisa, or all of them, honestly. There's quite a few of them who you just don't see anymore. And maybe it's an age out thing or whatever. But I'll give you like Kelly Lynch, Madeline Stowe, uh, Angelina Jolie, De- Kathleen Turner, just on and on and on of that era. Very, I think before Me Too, those women, I mean, imagine the meetings that they had to, or the showers they had to watch that fat fuck take. You know what I mean? And they were probably eventually like, I'm out. I'm out of this shit. I don't need it anymore. You know, because back then, yeah. I think it was just recently Chris, Kirsten Dunst was saying that th- on the ba- Spider-Man set, not that long ago, she was just like, there was, it was kind of a, a man, you know, old guy energy set and whatever. And they would say some shit to me and, but I couldn't say anything. Like, I'm, it was before me too. And I wasn't going to lose my job. So I was like, fuck it. I feel like Eva Mendez is like that too. She's like, I'm out. I don't need this shit anymore. She's not jealous of her no, husband. She yeah. doesn't care. She sells spongy. She's got sponge but line. Also, and also like Gwyneth Paltrow, I think people think like it's tragic that they're not doing movies anymore. I'm like, they don't need the money. Yeah. They already experienced it at all. They got to go to the movie premieres. They you got to it. be in the movies. They got to have the fans. They got to, um, you know, win the awards. And they don't really miss actually being on set and waiting boring. around and having their, right. their back hurt from standing up mm-hmm. and being in the trailer and missing their home and their pets and their kids. Right. And they're just like, yeah, if something comes to me, great. But like, I'm totally fine with that being one part of my life, or you're like a Reese Witherspoon who you were like, I'm not ready to give it up, so I'm going to do the smartest thing, start my own company, yeah. buy all these great books, produce and stuff, and and still act. Like, yeah. she's really parlayed it perfectly. Nicole Kidman, too. I mean, yeah, and doing the both, TV, the movie, everything. I mean, Yeah, both they've are done it right. But I think there's other people that are like, it's fine. Like, yeah. just like anybody else. Like, uh, someone that's like, you don't want to teach anymore? And so I was like, no, I'm yeah. good. Or it's right. like when I said to my mom, mom, don't you want to make the turkey this year? And she goes, no, I really don't. Yeah. And I go, but you love doing the turkey. You love cooking. And she goes, no, I really don't. I'm really tired and I really just want to go to your house and not. And I was like, oh, like, yeah. you know, you you just think that like <laughs> exactly. your mom loved cooking and cleaning. And it's like, no, she'd actually like to show up, have a glass of wine, eat, yeah. and fucking leave. And she's done all the turkeys. She's gotten all the accolades, and she's good. I just moved to a new agency, and they wrote me the other day an email, like, and blah, 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 great this, that, and we'll get, continue to just stand up and everything else. And would you be interested in getting back into acting? I was like, fuck no. Like, did I have you, no- Is that what you wrote, or what did you say? I sure. mean, I wrote back, like, I, it's really not my interest anymore to go, like, audition or read for hosting jobs or whatever. Okay. Because- like, I just know I'm not going to get it and why even bother driving to Culver City you know well, I do think a lot can be on self tape now I know but I don't I, but I, even I, that is too much it's technology too much. and effort like you if somebody asks you to like, are you interested in that shit anymore You're the like, few times I've had to do it on self tape <laughs> either my kids or my husband which basically I have three husbands nobody is patient enough to shoot you like over and over yeah, yeah. and I know. then I'm like if 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 the part is for a frustrated, annoyed mother and wife, then a hundred percent, I need to do it. Yeah. Talk to the camera, have them, f- and be like, Ugh, and then I'll be like, you know, then then that'll be great. Then yeah. that'll be amazing acting. But then I also hear that like people feel like they do that. And I don't know how it works with the self tape. It kind of started with COVID. All and- my friends who are actors now, I mean, they they hate the self tape because like, well, I can't. When I was in the room with the cat, I could I could differentiate myself from right, everybody. Right, and they can give you notes. Yeah, exactly. They can go, actually, you're not supposed to be this annoyed. What you don't know is in the script earlier. They can explain something, and you're like, oh, okay, okay, now let me try it again. Because they want you to get the part two. They want their... So yeah. I don't know where that's going with uh, the auditioning. I remember like a couple of years ago, I got one. I was in a hotel room doing stand-up, whatever, and I remember like propping up a my phone on a pillow in the hotel room and I was trying to do it. I'm like, what am I doing? But and then they were like, send it PDF. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> like I had to go down and ask the girl at the, at the Hilton Garden Inn, like, could you send this to? Oh, so embarrassing. I'm so happy to be like kind of rid I, of that. I remember doing that same thing. I was at my friend's house in Tampa where yeah. you're going to be. Um, <laughs> And it was like, I had to play a lawyer or something. She had a beautiful home. So I was like, okay, this is good. We'll do it like in your husband's office. And we we're like trying to film it. Of course I didn't get it. Yeah. But still it like screwed up my whole day. Like I had to get hair makeup. Oh, it's the like, worst. And 
But it's also like there's the young Heather, old Heather right. can never pass up an audition or an opportunity. I cannot just say, you know what? I'm going to pass. I don't think I've ever done that. Like even I, maybe now, I, maybe now I'm starting, yeah, right. but like, it's really hard to, to, to even think that that's an option, you know, like, Oh, it's an option, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I see now more than ever. And now we realize yeah. it. Um, mm-hmm. Trish Cyrus, she says there's definitely issues with her new marriage. This is Miley's mother married this guy, Dominic. He's a big actor, Dominic Purcell, yeah. And apparently they got married and he slid into her DMs, but she didn't see it for a year. But I guess during that year, I'm assuming, is when he started to date Noah, her daughter. Right. So he dated Noah first. They broke up. Noah's marrying somebody else. So I guess she's fine with it. But it's out there that he dated the daughter. Then he started dating Trish. And that is why Noah and the brother were not at the wedding. Yeah. But she says that the, they're, they definitely have some marital issues. And it's because they are different signs. And I just marital thought that issues. Is they so... got married three weeks ago. I mean, it's already. I know. Yeah. So she said in 2016, he DM'd me. I didn't see it for a year. So I don't know. She said, I'm a Taurus and he's an Aquarius. And apparently, astrologically speaking, that's not a match made in heaven. Uh-huh. Okay, people. Yeah. I mean. You can't with this astronomy signs. Yeah. You cannot. I know people love it. and But I just feel like it's such a way to like say either I shouldn't marry this person or I should. Yeah. But I I know it's weird because sometimes you read the things and they are pretty like dead on. I know. But I feel like you fit your thing into it. You know, you're reading like, I am like that. But it, you could, it's kind of written so vaguely that you could yeah. put anything out, you know, into it. Right. But yeah. I sometimes I, I've, I always read them, you know, I'm always, it's interesting. I always wonder if like, I guess the astro, astronomical signs, astro, what is it? Astrology. Astrology. Astro- astrological. It is about the day you came out of someone's vagina. Right. But I'm like, but is it though? Or what is, is it your when you're sign? conceived? I'm a Gemini. I'm June 14th. Me too. What? You're, you're a late Gemini. What are you I'm, June- May, I'm cusp, May 21st. Oh, so you're on the cusp of cancer. No, of Taurus. Not unlike Dominic no. Purcell. Oh, cancer's yes. after. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, cancer's yeah. after. Mm-hmm. I have never even looked into like my kids' signs and see, thought, if are they really like that or not? I've just... I don't know. I think once I used to be more into it. Right. And then I was like, I, I remember like friends being like going to psychics and stuff. And I'm like, some psychic's going to tell you that, you know, the, the guy you're going to marry um, has a C in his name or something. And right now you're dating a guy named Ben. Right. So now all of a sudden that's in your head and you're going to be like, a oh, Ben is really not the one. And that's why I'm like, I think all that stuff just gets Especially when it's about love and stuff. I, I don't need know. to know. I don't think it's good. I need to know how, how come psychics are the only seeming business that seems to be able to just put a sign right on the front lawn of their <laughs> regular suburban home. Like when nobody else could do that. But you'll be driving to a neighborhood and you'll see a big sign on yeah. someone's front lawn. Psychic or a neon sign in the window. And I'm like, well- you can't do that if you're a plumber, like a big sign. It's against the, like the, I don't know. I feel like there's zoning laws against that. But the psychics, big fucking so sign on the front true. lawn. How come there they're allowed to do that? There is a house on the corner Every, all across over LA. from Kaiser Permanente. Yeah. And the other side is the school. And I know exactly the house you're talking about. It's a pretty about. nice house. Yeah. And it's like these big psychic signs. It's, I'm like, is anybody really just like in a fight with their boyfriend and they'd like fucking just pull over? Yeah, And then are like, I just need to talk to somebody. Like, should I marry this guy or not? Come in and, you know, and like, or what are you coming out of Kaiser Permanente? And you're like, do I have cancer or not? Let me just, let me just go over and like talk right. to this woman. My, I had a friend who went once years ago. Yeah. And of course about some guy. And she was like, what you need to do. And I remember, I thank God talked my friend out of it. She was asking for either five or $1,500. To put a spell oh. on him. Shit. And then there was another one where you put your period blood in their coffee. Oh. Oh, and they, no. Without them knowing. Yeah. And somehow then they'll, you they'll know, get the pop spell? the question. I don't know. Oh, like, is that right? 
I don't know. And I was okay. just like, this is just, come on. Like, uh, come on with this. I was in a bar many years ago in LA. Yeah. And you know how they come around selling the roses? Yeah. And it was late at night and a woman who was coming around selling roses and I said, no, no, I'm okay, whatever. And she put a spell on me. She was like, you now will, will have a spell forever. And she walked out and I swear to God, from that day you forward, felt like you had that- I never, like I achieved something, but not a lot. And I'm like, maybe that was the spell. Like she didn't, I didn't she's like, your spell is, you won't get to, it's huge. You'll always you'll never. You'll <laughs> never be the best friend in a you'll sitcom. You'll forever play half-filled comedy clubs for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm like son of a bitch. You know, not all spells are gonna die. Some spells are just like you're gonna be mediocre for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm like, so I always think about that. I'm always like, what is the spell working? I just always say, like, how did like I show me the psych? Show me when you have people tape their readings. You know, yeah. I just want someone to show me a reading that they got in early March of 2020 right? and was like, what does the next year of my life look like? And if that psychic doesn't say, I see you spending a lot of time at home yeah, and um, working from home and staying at home and your travel plans are going to be canceled yeah, for some reason. I bet there's some people who could say that that happened. Well, then I need to hear the tape. All right. You'll, oh, you're going to get many of them now. I need to hear the actual tape of where someone, even if they didn't say, I see a massive, uh, because then maybe they, because then yeah. they could go, well, we don't see like a war, but we know that there'll be destruction. Yeah. Or something. Like I need to see something like, I was just reading you. I was seeing your future. So you didn't get COVID. You didn't lose your job. You didn't die. But you spent a year in your house. Right. You, you know, worked from home Mm -hmm. and you didn't get to go anywhere. And I don't know why it says you're not going anywhere. And the girl's like, but wait, I have a whole trip planned to Europe in the spring. Well, I don't know what to tell you. I I don't know why, but it's showing me you're not going. And that was like March of 2020. Then I'd be like, that psychic is seeing something. They're actually yeah. seeing the future of you, of the per- person they're reading. Well, I mean, I'm always, it's always fascinates me. Also, when people talk to the dead people. Yeah, that's a good one too. Never once is it ever like, it's always like, he's happy, he's fine. There was a reason why you couldn't be there that last day, right? Yes, yeah. I was taking my medical finals he's fine with that. Like, I just want one psychic to be like, okay, he's still fucking pissed at you. <laughs> yeah. he's Your dad right, is pissed. Right. He he says you're a disappointment. <laughs> he doesn't like what you're doing with your life. Yeah. He hates your husband. And he's still mad that you never cleaned out the garage that day. And then they're like, oh my God, my dad's like, yeah, he's an asshole. He's in heaven, but he's still an asshole. Like right. something or like, they are. The, he is mad that you served potato salad at his funeral just right. something it's always positive yeah I, that's true it's always like there's got to be one person well because it's not i don't really believe it but i know people get mad that i say oh, I they people it. love it i mean i'm so glad that, but that's why it works because you never hear a negative thing from someone on the other side yeah. they're always okay that they died they're always okay how you handle the funeral they're always okay that you were busy on the day that they died yeah. they're always healthy and dancing around in heaven well, maybe you They're get to a place mad. where, yeah. So it's like, then you're happy to, so then you're just like, there's no harm in talking. Even if it's fake, there's no yeah. harm in talking because they don't tell you something like, you're the reason I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, you forgot to right. whatever, give me my medicine. Like, yeah. it's never that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, there's some um, real estate divorce news. Oh. Brittany Snow was married to this cute guy on Selling OC. Yeah, this is a good one. And um, he was very flirty with this girl. And in the second season, they end up kissing. Her name's Alex Hall. Yeah. She came on Juicy Scoop. Oh. And I remember I talked to her and I go, I, this before they announced her divorce. And I go, well, I think Brittany Snow and Tyler are going to get divorced. And she goes, why do you think that? And I go, I think because Brittany Snow's the actress. She thought she was marrying a normie. Yeah. And now he's a huge star. Right. And he's hot. And yeah. that's not what she gambled for. She thought she was marrying a guy who could do real estate with his dad and surf while yeah. she went on to be, you know, continue to be a star. Right. And I don't know what she's been in lately, but it's not the top real estate show that her ex-husband is. And then I think there was something maybe going on between them, maybe not, but probably. And But I really think it was that she just was like, I don't like it. But didn't they wind up getting married? 
Didn't he no. marry the real estate girl? No, I think they are they dated a little, but I think oh, they're still okay. single. Oh, I don't know. She wrote me. She said she wants to come back on Juicy Scoop. Because so I saw Britney Snow on Call Her Daddy or something, and yeah. she was talking about it, saying she like watched it and Yeah, the she's like, I don't happened. need to. Yeah. Yeah. So like getting kind of mad about it. But again, this is all great because I think their season's coming up soon. So you've oh, got to get okay. all this chatter going Yeah, there you go. That's before. what we were discussing earlier. Also, real, um, Selling Sunset LA. Okay. The This girl, Chelsea from England, she and her husband are getting divorced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know. Is that, that still on, Selling Sunset LA? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? I mean, it's probably coming back. Yeah. Christine Quinn, who was on it, Oh, that, the husband her husband. Went, but he was also on it. He was on it too. Yeah. And then they had a baby. And now they're in this domestic violence um, situation where she called the cops. Yeah. He tried to say, he tried to get a restraining order against her saying she's going to kidnap the kid. The judge didn't allow it. There was awful stuff in the report. Like he threw like dog poo yeah. at her. Like awful, verbal, awful. He's awful. Well, according to, allegedly, according to that. We shared a nanny. We had oh, a, uh, my did. nanny a scoop. and their na- was uh, was their her nanny too, mm. and my nanny who I was good, well had for lover, greatest lady, she would she was so happy to be working with Christine. She was like it's fun, and then one day they just cut her loose, she, and she was very upset about it. She's like, God, I thought we were kind of friendly, we were doing well, and they just fired me. Anyway, she went on she she went on to stay with us, and now she's with uh. Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. You know what I wonder? Yeah. Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell, what do you mean, the grandchildren? She's, no, the grandchildren, yeah. Oh, so she's when still, they have the yeah, grandchildren, yeah, yeah, yeah. they have the little She still hands. babysits for Beckett, but she- Yeah, uh, but Beckett's in school. She, she comes over to our house. She goes, oh, last night I was at Goldie and Kurt's. We had a sleepover with the kids. Like, oh, must be nice. <laughs> Sorry about our dump. Yeah, so she's doing great. I'm sure she made sure- But that- anyway, she was Christine Quinn's nanny too, and I don't know Okay, so what I think happened with that, and she probably didn't realize it, but probably the husband, it's just a control thing. Yeah. I think he became more and more controlling and like insecure and controlling. And she probably loved the nanny. Yeah. And he was like, you're not getting in, you know, and like, and then with, and then she's just like, I don't even want this woman to see how weird he is. I'd yeah. rather just let her go. Right. Like, like, I think she was like protecting and then I've also, I also know someone who lived in the neighborhood that would hear that they would fight and scream and fight. And there was a lot of fighting. And then there was I, from someone else that she was trying to rent a house yeah. at one point to leave him. Yeah. And then didn't follow through with the rental. So what did he do? So recently? I think she tried, he threw a bag of glass. And, and hit the kid or something? The kid was okay, but hit the kid. And Where do you find a bag of glass? Who knows if they were just like cleaning up and oh. something broke and there's fighting and who knows yeah. what they're like, they're a... Uh, you know, in a contentious fight, how some awful person would act. Yeah. But wow. I hope she gets away from him. I hope she, that both these girls are back on the selling sunset because they liked each other. Yeah. This girl, Chelsea and Christine, they can wear their tiny outfits and go date yeah, guys right. and get listings. Yeah. Bring it back. Bring it back. I, on uh, Easter, we got this little, um, you know, gingerbread house, but it was like an Easter version. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, come on, Haley. Like, you know, and Brandon did it too. Like, let's just decorate it. And then Brandon goes, Mom, when once we decorate the house, you have to act like it's a selling sunset oh, house. Oh, I watched it. So he did the video and yeah. everything, and I sold the house for just under $18 million. Oh, wow. Yeah, I got multiple offers yeah. in Instagram. So it was, must have been in Malibu. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I said it was in LA County. Oh, okay. So it's just under 18, and I said it was um, one-fourth of a square foot. Yeah. It has no bathrooms, no bathrooms, <laughs> no baths. Yeah. But, you know. But you could, it, if it went down and out, you could eat it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but went down in value? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So, Chris, tell everybody where they can find you. I am in uh, Tampa. Side Splitters in Tampa, Saturday night. And then I'm in uh, Dania Beach Improv on Sunday night, this weekend that you're listening to this. And then I go to uh, Rooster Tea Feathers in Sunnyvale, Dallas Hyenas, and uh, so many more um, places. Frangiola.fun. Has every all my live dates cover to cover and all that. Come on out. We're having a great time on the road. It's a lot of fun. Yes. And now for my very juicy interview view from the writer who really broke down the whole Jay Shetty thing and how stories get um, squashed. And it's very interesting. Super juicy Hollywood story. And of course, everything for me is at heathermcdonald.net. See you at Palm Beach this weekend. But now for this juicy interview. 
Hello, and welcome to Juicy Scoop. I'm very excited because I have the journalist, John McDermott. Welcome to Juicy Scoop, who wrote the article in The Guardian uncovering the higher truth of Jay Shetty. And I'm so excited to talk to you about it. I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. I, I talked about it on a previous show because it was a hot topic. And I suggest, let me give, a little, give me a little background of what it's like to be a real journalist where you're really going deep and doing these investigative pieces because that is something I don't do. Mm. A lot of people sometimes get mad that I don't have all the facts and things. And I'm like, this is, I'm a comedian and this is comedic commentary about things I find juicy. So that's why I'm glad to have the real person here to like answer all the questions. Sure. I'm a freelance journalist based here in Los Angeles. Uh, do a lot of writing or did a lot of writing in the past for Esquire magazine. I've also written for GQ, the New York Times, Chicago Tribune. When I lived in Chicago, I wrote for them. So I've written for a number of different publications. And um, yeah, we're, again, work as a freelancer. So I kind of pick my own projects. But how does that work? Like they they say, hey, we want to do a piece on Jay Shetty. We'd love to. You Like, how does it all start? That sure. And then yeah, where, yeah. what are the steps that you take as the journalist to get that you know, several pages long story in a fancy magazine. Mm. Typically, most of the times I operate where I'm pitching the stories. I come okay. with an idea and then I will pitch it to an editor or several different editors at various publications where I think it would be a good fit. And if they want it, they buy it. And if they don't, they pass. And, you know, if they want it, you kind of work out what you think the angle would be, the length of it, what the fee would be, all that stuff. And then you execute the piece. This was pretty atypical because I would say the vast majority of the pieces I write are stuff that ideas I come up with and I pitch. This was actually pitched to me and was assigned to me by Esquire. And okay. I want to make sure to cover this because Jay's publicists and his attorneys have tried to portray me as this obsessed hater who has a preoccupation with Jay and uh, I, I was acting with malintent, right? Okay. My, my intentions were impure. Uh, I did not know who Jay Shetty was until I received this assignment from Esquire magazine. And the only reason I received this Esquire, this assignment from Esquire magazine is because Jay's publicists asked for me specifically to write this article when they pitched it to Esquire. I'd written about one of their other clients previously. They enjoyed that article. That was kind of a light and fluffy piece about a different type of influencer. Her name is Tinks. I don't know. Oh, if, yeah, I know Tinks. Yeah. So you did something on Tinks. Okay, a, great. A day in the life of Tinks. And okay. I wanted to capture, you know, I'm very kind of interested with what's going on culturally right now. We're in this very interesting position where yes. fame is kind of hard to define. Like who's really famous in the internet age, you know? Yeah. Uh, Jay Shetty is a good example. You know, this is somebody who has tens of millions of followers, but I've also had, you know, close personal friends of mine who read this story after I shared it and they're like, I had no idea who this guy was. So, right. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Because media is so fractured now, mm -hmm. someone can have this intense, rabid fan base that's even in the millions of followers, but then be completely unknown to someone else. You know, when, right. I, was, when I was growing up, there were like a handful of famous people. And everyone knew who they were. It's totally different now. Exactly. Or it's like yeah. who my kids will know. Right. And, you know, this person that's a YouTuber or whatever. And just like, you know, I, of course, have a different reference. But yeah, yeah. as we grew up, there were the famous people and they were on the magazines, the Us totally. Weeklies and all that stuff. And now it's just totally different. Uh, before we get into this, I was going to ask you, do you feel, you know, when I was – at Chelsea lately, we would have all the, we'd get all the magazines. Yeah. And then there would be these longer articles about whatever, Gwyneth Paltrow. Right. And I used to joke that they would always be written the same way that totally. like, she arrived, she was nice to the waitress, she ordered a tea as she wished the hair behind her ear. And I was like, why is it always like what they ordered? And like, yeah. there was such a formula to that. And now that there's opportunities for everybody to tell their story on a podcast, either as a guest or their own. Has that affected your business of writing these these bigger pieces for magazines? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Tinks, people like Jay Shetty are no longer as reliant on a magazine such as Esquire to reach people. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of changed the power dynamic where magazines for the, the entire time, they were the medium through which 
celebrities were exposed to the world, right? So right. they kind of had the upper hand. Now it's totally flipped. You know, those magazines, they need famous people on the cover. So, you know, when housewives are shopping in Walmart and they're going through the checkout aisle, you know, they see, oh, you know, uh, Austin Butler is on the cover of the magazine. All right, I'll, I'll take this. Or whoever's on People right. or Us Weekly or whatever it is. Yeah. But they don't necessarily need it. So it has changed the dynamics such that there's not as much adversarial coverage now. Mm. It's much fluffier. It's always been kind of fluffy doing kind of access-driven PR or access-driven uh, celebrity journalism, which I've done. And, you know, I'm pl- proud of the celebrity profiles I, r- I wrote. You know, I've profiled Nikki Glaser. She was very yeah, fun. Um, right. And yeah, I mean, she was very honest about her struggles with her eating disorder and her various insecurities. I don't think it was a very fluffy profile, but it was access-driven, right? It, it was done with the understanding that you know, she would not have been doing it if it were not for a publication as reputable well as Esquire. So, but w- with that, sure. I still do love reading, obviously, these kind of articles because it is different. Like, and I've been a yeah. subject of these, and I really enjoy reading them after to hear that you have this conversation with um, the writer, you know, and they ask you questions and everything. But then I love that it they write. You know, sometimes their point of view or or some other thing that yeah. they pulled from another interview you did and make it, tr- which is different than just hearing a conversation yeah, on a podcast. Absolutely. And it, it gives you a different insight and a different perspective that I still think is super important and relevant today. Absolutely. And yeah. when access driven celebrity journalism is done well, it can be very revealing. Yeah. And it can it can be more than just pure fluff. Right. But so I wrote that piece on Tinks. Right. And again, that was just kind of, I was interested in what it was like to be this rising self-help influencer. Or she's not a self-help influencer. Sorry. But like advice and Right. She's a lifestyle. And she she really blew up during the pandemic. And she did the unique thing of, um, here's your starter pack as a mom in Palo Alto, which was very clever. And a lot of people have kind of copied that formula for different things. She's clever. And now she does original work, which I think is- Uh Important to note for our purposes here today. Right. Uh, you know, and then there are people who don't like tanks. Like, I don't care if you like tanks. I don't care if you don't like tanks. Right. But I think she's an interesting person yes. and she was worthy of a profile. And also it kind of speaks into this larger conversation uh, about influencers and what fame really is in this age. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, she leads, leads a glamorous lifestyle. Like we ate at the Ivy. Yeah. You know, and I wrote, I did all, all of the tropes you're talking about, yeah. you know. I wrote about she ordered the crab salad. I did all that. So... <laughs> Okay, good. She is represented by the same PR agency Got that it. represents Jay. Um, they ask Esquire, Jay, Jay's new book was coming out in either late 2022 or very early 2023. So okay. either you know December 2022 or January 2023. He was going on a big book tour for it. So they say, hey, we really like what John did with the Tinks piece. We know he's in L.A. Will he cover the L.A. portion of Jay's book tour? My editor brings this to me. She says, are you available to do this? I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And my original idea for the piece, again, did not know who Jay Shetty was. I don't really follow this kind of pseudo spiritual wellness space that closely. I'm not against it per se, although I do think there are some structural problems Mm -hmm. that need to be uncovered as evidence here. Um, but I was kind of interested in exploring it because the mainstreaming of mental health and now it's being kind of combined with this spiritual element is fascinating to me because now when you combine it, the two together, you never really have to answer for either one because yeah, if you dismiss it, you're like, oh, well, that's just a bunch of, you know, new age spiritual mumbo jumbo. You could be like, well, no, well, I reference all of this empirical psychological research that's very kind of based in science. And so you can point to that and that kind of gives it some legitimacy. But if you say, well, well, okay. So then if you start to dive into the scientific part, then you could be like, well, there's, it's spiritual, you know, and it's not really subject to scientific inquiry. Right. Okay. So it kind of straddles both of these lines and there's just not a lot of accountability there. Okay. So, 
that was my original kind okay, of take. That, oh, and, that was your take, yeah. And, okay. and also, and Jay was just kind of an entryway to talk about the mainstreaming of these topics. And, you know, when I was growing up, going to see a psychiatrist, going to see a psychologist was kind of stigmatized. And right. now just all of these psychological terms are just thrown around in everyday day conversation. The gaslighting, narcissism. Trauma. Yeah. You know, people just- Trauma dump. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. These things are- Mainstream in a way that I never could have anticipated. So I, that, just, wait, yeah. I just have to say, I just started an ad on like regular radio in LA that was like, did you grow up in LA? I swear it was California or LA and are suffering from toxic trauma. Toxic trauma. But it wasn't like, it wasn't like, you know, were you working at, you know, this Lockheed or whatever and we yeah. lost it? But it was like, did you grow up in LA and you're just like, <laughs> toxic, toxic trauma. Did you drink the trauma water? And I'm like, well, probably I grew up in LA. Yeah. Am I dealing toxic? But it's, yeah, yeah, it's this kind of thing. But okay, continue. Right. So I go and that's kind of what my original take is. I have lunch with Jay. We do the interview over lunch. We're at Oceana in Santa Monica. Very nice. The hotel there. Yeah. Uh, and then we kind of split. His show was in the evening. We split for the afternoon and then I went to the show. And it was during the show that, you know, my suspicions had kind of been raised. I read his book. His book was bad. And, uh, is this a, his second book? How many so books has I, he had? Yeah. And if this was his second book. I actually read his second book first. Okay. So I had been working on some other deadlines and uh -huh. was not able to read both of the books. But okay. I did with the understanding. I was like, all right, I'll read the second book because that's, you know, what we're covering here. Right. And then I'll go in and fill in the... Fill in the gaps. I'll read his first book, which is his kind of like introduction to the world, Think Like a Monk. That's his memoir. And I'll read that afterwards. So I read his second book mm -hmm. first. And I was kind of unimpressed uh, because, you know, here's this guy who markets himself as a monk, as a spiritual leader, and yet so little of what was in the book pertained to his experience as a monk. And I was like, well, if that's his origin story, if that's his, you know, basis for his authority... Where is it? Why isn't it in the book? It's all just pop psychology. That's just taken from all these other sources and put in the book, which I'm not against. The, I read a lot about psychology. I'm fascinated by what makes people uh, tick and how they interact with each other. So that's why I was able to clock it very easily as like, oh, these are all subjects that have been heavily covered by countless other people, again, with the mainstreaming of mental health and psychology. So- I was like, oh, that's a little bizarre. It's he's kind of unoriginal, which, you know, mm -hmm. not a crime, but yeah. sure, fine. Um, but then I go to the show and I was there were some off putting moments of the show where like what? He he started the show with a with a rap, like a spoken word performance. By himself? Yeah. Oh, he did it. Jay's original aspiration was to be a rapper. Yeah. Interesting. His idol, I I believe, is Eminem. So in <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, apparently, you know, when he was a teenager, he kind of, you know, like the London, the term in London would be like rude boy, like somebody who- Because he grew uh, up in London, yeah. Right. Somebody who traffics in kind of like gangster, urban aesthetics, okay. you know, that, um, and, you know, kind of interesting for somebody who came from a traditional Indian family. Mm -hmm. But so he wanted to be a rapper. And actually in the investigation, we found- a video of him rapping on stage at a Hare Krishna event when he was a teenager. Okay. Before he claims to have ever had any kind of background in spirituality. So he's like, oh, this my first introduction was going to this thing, not, and, you know, and when I was 16, coincidentally, I was able to do a rap, but he never said that. Right. So that's, Jay to me, that's very weird. As someone who has written memoirs, shared everything about my life, and especially on this podcast, that's what I was trying to convey when I just covered yours for a little bit on yeah. it. That, no, that is wrong. If your whole career is tell kind of sharing about yourself and being authentic, and then we find out that like the stories that we were told are not totally right or not true or not in the actual, the timeline changes, that tells me a lot about the person. And you bring up an interesting point. You know, some of the reactions I've gotten is like, well, what does it matter? You know, yeah. I like the content Jay has shared. It's been meaningful to me. And right. I don't want to take that away from anyone. You know, right. if you, you know, if Jay shared something new that's resonated, yeah. that's great. You know, and that feeling that you felt is just as real. Right. 
uh, but when people try to make this separate the art from the artist argument, which is something I genuine, generally agree with, you know, Kanye West is one of my favorite musicians. Michael Jackson. Are you going to, if, if totally. you're, if you're at, if you're shopping at the mall and you hear pretty young thing, are you going to like immediately run out of Nordstrom because you saw leaving Neverland? Right. And you, I, I believe that doc, I be, I've always believed mm -hmm. that about him. I never choose to play that music, but yeah, if I'm someplace and it's playing, do I find myself bopping to it? Yeah. Fair. <laughs> totally a fair comparison. Yeah. The difference is that with Jay, there isn't that separation between art and artist. He is selling himself. Mm -hmm. He is the product. Mm -hmm. Everything is about him and funnels into him and his backstory. So once that backstory comes into question, you know, what are, what are we left with? That's the question. You know, that would be my response to people who, you know, make that defense of Jay. So you're at the the show. It starts right. out yeah. with a fun rap that he does. And yeah. then what? Kind of like a spoken word okay. style performance. Uh, and then the first segment that I kind of looked sideways at was that he, you know, he asked a crowd who's like, who has trouble putting down their phone? And of course, you know. Everybody. Right. Uh, he invites, he was like, so would someone like to come up on stage? Uh, this young woman comes up on stage. She talks about, you know, how she's trying to get better about leaving her phone around. He's like, well, you know, putting her phone down. He's like, well, so to demonstrate this, we're going to put you in this sensory deprivation chamber. And he kind of brought a literal black box out onto the stage and put noise canceling headphones on her and then just had her sitting there. And we watched her from a live feed, like on the and so she just screen. has to sit there by herself, just like she's twiddling like, her thumbs. A little bit. So bizarre. she doesn't get to watch the show or anything. She has to just be like that for well, like ten minutes. Or, okay. Or so. Very weird. A little bizarre, and not really bizarre. fair to the person that just thought they were going to get to maybe do a Q and A with him in a sense. And now right. they're in this and thing. I don't recall him telling her that she would be on a live feed. Right to the rest of the audience. Maybe they discussed it in hushed tones on the on the probably not on the but, stage. Yeah, okay. But I I don't remember mm -hmm. him asking that. If it happened, I didn't hear it. Okay. So then later on, late in the show, the show was three and a half hours. By the way, mm -hmm. it had an intermission. Was, Did everyone come back after the intermission? <sighs> For the most part, yeah, I saw. Yeah. Okay. I because I was there with press, like. Uh, I was sitting among kind of the other VIPs. Okay. So it was just kind of a who's who of everyone who operates within this space. Again, okay. not people I know, but the woman I sat next to was like, oh, there's Lewis Howes and, you know, all these other wellness luminaries okay. and podcasters. So uh, toward the end, again, he asked kind of a general question. He was like, who here is having trouble with a relationship in their life? Again, everyone can apply to everyone. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Um, invites this other woman onto the stage. She tells this story about how she's been estranged from her brother for years, haven't talked in years. And Jay has her call him on the stage. First call goes to voicemail. Jay takes the phone out of her hand, ends the call, and immediately calls it back and instructs her. She was like, this time if it goes to voicemail, I want you to leave a message. Again, in front of an audience of, I want to say close to 3,000 people. Yeah. Who's at the YouTube theater in the kind of SoFi yeah. complex uh and we'd listen to this woman give a very heartfelt difficult message to her brother whom again hasn't talked to in years a very kind of intimate personal moment um shared with three thousand of your closest friends and there's no question that that maybe this wasn't a plant i did not get that impression okay. i mean is it possible sure but mm -hmm. just the way these women behaved seemed authentic yeah. right and there mm -hmm. was nothing Especially kind of theatrical about yeah. it. Yeah. That, that would make me think that. But a, a bunch of people have asked that because I know in shows similar like these, you know, that's not uncommon right. to have a plant. Um, so when that was happening, when the woman was leaving the voicemail, I distinctly remember the woman, two seats to my right in the audience, she audibly said, this is mortifying. Um, uh, it, it was just... Again, kind of an off-putting energy. And okay. you know, other friends of right. mine that I know who uh, who were at that were, they came in big fans of Jay Shetty. They left not so big fans of mm. Jay Shetty. They, okay. Just in general, the atmosphere and the ambiance of the event uh, kind of put them off. So I was 
You know, I was just like, well, so what do we know about this guy? Mm -hmm. You know, he writes this book. It's pretty unoriginal. He has a stage show that's kind of Tony Robbins-esque right. in its uh, execution. Um, and, you know, there was an, another incident before. So Jay monetizes every single aspect. I mean, nickel, dimes, nickel and dimes every single part of the way. So Give us some examples. So he charged something like $300 for a VIP package, which meant you got to attend a Q&A before the show that included a meditation session. And then you got to meet Jay afterward and do a meet and greet and like, you know, get two minutes, shake his hand. Mm -hmm. um, pretty, you know, it's a nice chunk of change. Yeah. But during the Q&A beforehand, I remember this woman asked a very, what I thought was a very poignant question. So again, he has his book, Eight Rules of Love. It's all about relationships and how to improve your relationships. No one ever bothered to ask why a monk who took a vow of celibacy <laughs> Would be an authority right. on relationships. He took a vow of celibacy, was celibate during his time as a monk, and then married the first girl he started dating once he left the ashram. So this woman asks about non-monogamy. And she was like, you know, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, different types of non-monogamous re relationships, be they poly or, yeah. you know, monogamish or stuff like that, which I thought was a very pointy question, you mm -hmm. know. Especially uh, for today. Yeah. Totally. I mean, I mean, these the definition of how uh, a relationship can be in its various mm -hmm. forms is kind of being brought into question, and a lot of people are trying to redefine that. Mm -hmm. And Jay didn't really have an answer for her. He just kind of spoke in circles. He's like, well, you know, you have to talk with your partner and communicate and find out what works with you. Again, very generic, nothing very substantive. So... I went home and over the next few days, I was like, all right, well, what do we know about this guy? And I found all this information that, you know, inspired me to take up this investigation. So what was some of the things you found out that were put out there by him that you pro that w that you found were not accurate? The thing that really inspired me to take this up was this video by Nicole Arbor. Mm, yes. If you know who she is. Yes, I mentioned yeah. that part of your article on my uh, show. I mean, this was... So it's like 2017 or something, wasn't it? Or 19? I want to say 2019 okay, or 19. Uh -huh. 2020 mm -hmm. that she put out this video very explicitly showing yeah. that Jay was a serial plagiarist and that his social media fame was fueled by taking other people's content and pawning it off as his, as his own. Yeah. Um, and again, this had been out there for, I'm going to say three years at the time. Her video. And Her she video. was very popular. Yeah. And the one thing that I don't understand is that so many other publications wrote all of these glowing profiles of Jay. And this a lot of this information that I found was just out there, yeah. just ready for the taking. It just took somebody to kind of put it all together. Um, yeah. Then, it's weird how yeah. some things, something can be so small and it, it really catches like a wildfire. Right. And every, and there's so, people are angry and they're, they're doing their own videos and they're this per, and you know, and then this, and then something like this, it's like, why did so few people care? I I do not understand. Um, I think, well, actually, I, I do know. Because when I was pitching this around, a lot of editors told me, like, so what's the big deal? You know, he's another self-help guy who whose backstory might not entirely check out. You know, there are a lot of people that have embellished or, you know, embellished their credentials or resume. What does it matter? To which I say, well, just as a general principle, it's not good to lie about who you are. Um, not calling Jay a liar. I'm just saying, as a general principle, if somebody misrepresents who they are, that's not a good thing. But it takes on an entirely different dynamic when you build an entire business around those claims. Mm -hmm. You know, Jay's life coaching school was taking seven grand for people for a life coaching certification that was based on some really dubious claims. And we can get into those details later. But when you're doing that, when you're taking well, no, people- let's just talk about the life because we're on it and then we'll go back. Sure. Well, so explain. Right. Well, when you're taking people's hard-earned money, there's right. material harm being done, you know? And yeah. I'm not saying people have to stop supporting Jay, but I think you should have all the facts about who this person is before you fork over, you know, your dollars. Yeah. So 
one thing we revealed in the investigation, and I have to credit my editor at The Guardian, Sam Wolfson, for really pushing me to explore this because at first I, f- I saw the life coaching school and it kind of smelled like an MLM. Yeah. But multi level marketing. Right. Yeah. But it's uh, right. Um, or as some people would say, a pyramid scheme. Mm. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, that didn't interest me as much as getting into his backstory. I just want to say I've yeah. covered L- MLMs a lot yeah. and I don't remember, but somebody wrote me. And they're like, Heather, I'm telling you, and this was probably six months ago, this life coaching thing is going to be the new scam that's uncovered Mm. because it is out of control. Who's hiring all these life coaches? I don't know one person who I actually I know one person was a realtor who hired a realtor life coach like five years ago. Other than that, I don't really know. I do have a friend who um, kind of created her being a divorce coach. Interesting. And I thought, and I think that her name's Alex Cap Horner, and I know her, and I think, and I thought it was genius, and I had her on my show. Sure. Because I'm like, it's a woman that's been through it, and they can kind of, not being an attorney, yeah. help you with all the things that, that you're not going to spend $300 crying to your attorney about. She's going to be like, <laughs> hey, get these things. And, yeah. and maybe you even meet with her before you let your husband know, whatever. I thought, now that's something valuable. Like, And a personal trainer is valuable. And if it's like a specific business, even like a realtor life coach that's like, okay, how many cold calls did you kind of force mm. you to go door knocking, whatever. But in general, life coaching, I don't really get it. And I don't get who's doing it. Yeah. And I'm not against coaching. Yeah. You know, know, in the general sense, I've had coaches in my life. I've had mentors in my life. I had journalism mentors. But if a coach, like a divorce coach, who's been through a very specific experience Mm -hmm. and is offering you advice about a specific area that they have expertise in, that is something different than a life coach. Right. What authority does this person have on life? What authority does anybody have on telling you how to live? And, you know, I found this series, a series of YouTube videos by this guy who was going through the Jay Shetty program. And he talked about how he wanted to be a life coach because he had failed in all of his other business endeavors. And I, and it was just struck me. I was like, I was like, well, why? Why would I hire someone that is not, wasn't successful? Like, it's one thing too to like, yeah, you're paying someone. And there are people that are really successful and they're like, I'll pay you $500 just to sure. talk to me for 20 minutes because Kel, I need your, yeah, you're right though. But Again. just someone that has no, like they're not successful financially or romantically or personally right. or anything. And now you're going to, and that person thinks that they're going to take this course and then be able to get 20 clients and make 500,000 a year. It's part of this cultural thing now where everyone just thinks they're going to be a millionaire doing as little work as possible. Totally. Whether it's crypto or podcasting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crypto. Or just like, you know, with the stock market craze when all yes. the meme stocks were going crazy. Everyone thinks they're gonna be the one who like has the secret and they're gonna, you know, work from their laptop beside a pool in Bali and doing this fake email job. That somehow so true. somehow pays them, you know, yeah. two hundred grand a year to live this lavish lifestyle. And Life just isn't like that, you know? I I mean, by virtue of my job as a journalist, I've interviewed a lot of successful people. By and large, successful people are talented and hardworking, and they did it for years before they broke through. It's not, they didn't take shortcuts, you know? So true. Okay, so getting back, so you start to investigate the life coaching thing. Right, so uh, in his marketing materials, Jay claimed that the Jay Shetty Certification School, which is his online life coaching certification program, was connected to various universities in the UK. He named four universities by name Um, and essentially was telling these people that by completing the Jay Shetty Certification School- For seven grand. For $7,400. I actually got on a call with uh, one of the enrollment advisors. Okay who is a salesperson. Uh, it's a person working 100% commission-based sales job, which I think is telling, you know. Mm-hmm. That person has no incentive to tell you, hey, you're not right for this, you know. Don't sign up for this. Their entire incentive is to get you to sign up. Right. That's the, their compensation depends on it. So um, that was- So a like pro- you could call right. and you could say, like, I live in a cabin 
200 <laughs> miles away from any other living being, and I actually don't have internet, but I'm thinking I take this course, could I be a life coach? And they would be like, yes, you can. I can't say, I don't want to okay, speak okay. in hypotheticals. <laughs> but possibly, yes. But it's possible, sure. Yeah. Uh, if they have evidence that they have turned people away, I would like to see it. Okay. Because in speaking with people who have gone through the Jay Shetty Certification School, people who've reached out to me after the article published, they got the sense that they were told it was going to be an exclusive group with small working groups oh. and very hands-on. They got the impression that they just let anybody in who was willing to pay. Did they ever uh, let people, did they ever say, we help you get clients or anything? There is a portion of it where they help you. They say, yes, we will help you market. To procure clients. Um, not that directly. They say they will help you market your okay. life coaching uh, school. And then they'll give you tactics to do online marketing and kind of build up this business of your own. So the one thing is he says, we're associated with these four universities and you found that to be what? Every single one of the four universities say, we have no idea who Jay Shetty is or why we are included in his marketing materials. There is no affiliation between our organization and theirs. And we want our names taken off the marketing materials. And all of those names have since been removed. Since from your article Sh came out. Yes. Interesting. Um, okay. So there's that. Right. He uh, also claimed it was accredited by a governing body that's based in the UK. And that governing body also said that the language on Jay Shetty's website as it pertains, pertains to them was inaccurate and misleading and that they wanted their name removed as well. And has their name been removed yes. too? Yeah. But right now it still exists. I could still pay the seven grand and join. Seven, thir 70, 400. As far as I know. Okay, but not, but from before this pu published, those people were all on it and now they're gone. Correct, yeah. Okay, so, and um, all right, what else? Talk about the monk situation. Okay, so Jay's, again, in, you know, when my suspicions were raised, well, so the plagiarism thing, I saw the- About all the, like, right. all, so he would do these videos and, you know, he is good looking. Right. He has an English accent, which oh, makes Ameri posh, Americans always posh think- British accent, People yes. that have an English accent are smarter than us. Piercing green eyes, yeah. like nice cheekbones. He's a handsome, it's a very Calming, nice package. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so he would be saying these quotes and philosophies yeah. and, you know, like- one of the most famous quotes of someone that I think is a great one to live with, and I, and we always were told Maya, Maya Angelou came up with this, and I believe that she has. I don't think there isn't, is when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. I remember Oprah having her on it, and that is something I quote. That's a Maya people, Angelou quote? That's I what know. I believe to be true. That's what I remember yeah. watching Oprah, her interviewing her, her saying it, and then it kind of going on, you yeah. know, just like. I believe Oprah was the first to be like, what's your aha moment? So whenever I say, as Oprah would say, what what was your aha moment to know that you should leave this person, whatever. Mm. So I think then sometimes people, but if all of a sudden we saw, it was like if we saw a video with Jay saying, you know, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. And he's selling it like he came up with that himself. That is what was going on with yeah. lots of philosophical and spiritual and inspirational quotes and right. and theories. Okay. He would take a, a tweet that some kind of, you know, just random Twitter user and kind of put it out and repurpose it on his Instagram to make it appear as though it was a Jay Shetty original. Uh, you know, no credit given. You know, I I would say even, you know, he still does this to this, to this day where he takes people's social media posts, repurposes them. He doesn't take a screenshot of the post and then post that. He puts them in his own format with a credit to that person, but it's still like kind of a gray area. Yeah. Like uh, if I ethically. sometimes do the inspirational quote thing, I do that. I just do the thing and then it goes to my stories and it's their right. thing. Totally. Yeah. But he does it without, you know, because mm -hmm. I interviewed some people. I was like, hey, I saw that your quote had been repurposed on Jay's channels. Did he talk to you about this? All the people I talked to said they had never heard from Jay or anyone from his team. They didn't give him permission and they didn't get compensation. He did credit them. He did tag them. But yeah, is that the right thing to do? I, you know, people have different feelings about that. I think at his level, no, it's not, right. in my opinion. But the plagiarism thing really stuck out to me because it is so easy to get caught for plagiarism on the internet. I mean, all you have to do is put the two posts side by side 
And there are timestamps there, and it can very clearly be an indication that someone lifted someone else's content. So my thought being, why would someone of this stature engage in those type of tactics? And if they were willing to do that, what else are they being potentially dishonest about? Isn't that really ping my radar? And, you know, I personally also, you know, you're an online creator. It's tough yeah. to make a living as a creative professional. So that somebody would take somebody else's content. Yeah, well, I mean, I've had stand-up jokes stolen right. and yeah. I've had, I've had, oh, yeah, I've yeah. had bits of my stand-up that shortly after it, like within months after my special went out, I saw a whole scenario acted out on a major sitcom. Oh, wow. They didn't yeah. a- didn't act out and yeah, like I told the story yeah. and it really did happen to us. And my kids were watching the show, and they were like, "Mom!" And on this particular show, we it would happen like three times. Wow! Did yeah. you pursue any no. remedy? Because I know how hard it is, and I totally. know that it's not yeah. worth it, and I know that the world doesn't care. Yeah. And then in this business, then it might make you look appear to be problematic, totally. and yeah. and just you know. Just like Louis C.K. didn't want those two girls to get writing jobs because he was afraid they would share the story of when he masturbated in front of them. Yeah. People will just want to keep you out of the rooms so that you don't share an unflattering story about them. Yeah. So it's like that. It's not as direct as people think it is in this business. Totally. And I think a lot of people have the mindset. I'm like, well, it was just a few memes. Right. That, that Jay lifted, or in your case, you know, it's just a little joke. Like yeah. they think these jokes are just floating around yeah. and just get, get plucked out of the air. I mean, you put thought into it, yeah. to brain power. You put, spent some time refining those bits, I'm sure. Right. Um, it took effort. Yeah. And I, I don't, you know, I don't think people always recognize that. Yeah. So then after the plagiarism stuff, I found all of these Reddit threads and some on Quora from people saying, they were from Jay's religious community in London and that his story didn't check out. So what was his story and what didn't match? Jay's story is that he was not interested in spiritualism until he was a freshman at Cass Business School in London. The name has since changed to Bay's Business School. Uh, and then one day he gets dragged to a lecture given by a monk and this Lecture just completely changes his life. He's so in awe of this monk and the wisdom uh, and just the the holy energy, holy energy radiating from this guy that it completely changes his life. And he goes on to pursue a life of spiritualism after he graduates, spends three years in an ashram in India. Um, he decides to leave because his calling is to use his gift as a speaker to share wisdom with the world. That's his origin story. And we began looking into that, and we found what we found. Which is? Uh, Well, first of all, that epiphany that he experienced at the lecture comes into question. So what I found is that I read both of Jay's books. I read the other book as well. Um, Literally, the first line of his book is that when I was 18 years old, I attended this lecture, right? That's the first line of the introduction to the book before even the first chapter. Okay. The problem with that is, is that Jay now says that it happened when he was in 2007. Jay wasn't 18 when he was in 2007. Jay and I are are just a month apart in age. We were both born in 1987. In 2007, he would have been at least 19 years old. Okay. If not 20. He would have turned 20 that year. So the book says 18. His official story that he gave us now through his attorneys that it was in 2007. He couldn't have been 18 in 2007. The math just doesn't work. And then in all these, you know, before we even went to his attorneys and all these other interviews, he said sometimes it was 18, sometimes it was 19, sometimes it was 21, sometimes it was 22. Again, this is- Oh, really? Yeah. See, see, to me, me, as someone who has shared and written about my childhood, college times, everything, there is no, you know how fucking old you were when you were a freshman in college- or when you, how old you were when you graduated in college. You know how old you were. Mm-hmm. He's not 95 trying to recall. He's in his, whatever he is, 40. Like, but so I'm like, I call, yeah, that to me says a lot. Yeah, he's 36. And again, yeah. this isn't like a stray minor detail. Yeah. This is what he describes as the single most transformational experience of his life. 
it changed the trajectory of his life irrevocably. It changed everything. And you know, when and somebody, he can't remember when it happened. When somebody has the opposite, when somebody has something traumatic happen to them, mm. they remember everything. Mm. Like they remember I was wearing this. I had this for breakfast. This was the last thing I said to my mom. You know, if something horrible happens, like yeah. the day their brother died, whatever. You remember that for years and years and years. So you would remember this the same way, right. in my opinion. Yeah. And I can't find any record that this lecture even occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked Cass Business School. Their records don't go back that far. Oh, so There's, you don't even, oh, so they don't know. Okay. All right. Uh, There's no, yeah, confirmation I mean, that happened. could have occurred. Right. But even more so than that. Jay's story that he didn't have a spiritual life. So he's, he always tells people that that was his first time he's ever met a monk. He told that to Ari Emanuel, okay. the head of William Morris right. Endeavor, which I don't know if your viewers will know, oh, well, is yeah. the single most high-powered talent agency in Hollywood. Right. You know, Jay is wrapped and backed by the elite of Hollywood, the most powerful people in this industry. So, uh, but even that story comes into question because we found proof that he had been a part of ISKCON, the International Society for Christian Consciousness, or the Hare Krishnas, since he was 14. He grew up in the religious organization. So he couldn't have possibly not met a monk until he was 18 or 19 or whenever it was. Mm. And we have video evidence showing him at various events attended by other monks that occurred before he claims that lecture. That, that yeah. moment. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so now you're finding this all out while you're writing this article for Esquire. Well, so when I initially found all these red threads, um, I went back to Esquire and I was like, hey, I know you wanted one thing, but I think we might have stumbled onto something else entirely here. And, you know, again, Jay's people have tried to brand me as somebody with a vendetta against Jay. Again, didn't know who Jay was before I got this assignment. But I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm not an ambitious reporter. When I get a juicy, juicy scoop, sc right, yeah. exactly, I'm going to pursue it. Yeah. And this was, you know, and I told them, I was like, this is a scoop that doesn't come around very often. Right. And I was like, I'm not sure this guy's story checks out. And so I sent them, I was, you know, I sent them a Nicole Arbor video. I sent them another YouTube video by a different YouTuber named uh, Kia. Kia's world. She does great YouTube training. She's a journalist by trade, but does this incredible YouTube channel breaking down the wellness industry if mm. you're in, and it's the various people in it. So I sent them all that. I sent them these various Reddit threads and what little I had found about these inconsistencies in Jay's timeline. And Esquire killed the piece. Right then and there. And they were not interested in turning what was supposed to be a fluffy profile into an investigation. Now, what I said when I saw that part of the story was I was like, this is the this is what you people want to really know. Yeah. That it's there is an elite power thing that happens in Hollywood and it's not worth it to them to piss off these people. Again, and then have yeah. and then not have any more clients from them. Not done it. Piss them. It's not worth it for this one article totally. or issue. And but so that's so that happened. So then, what did you do? Well, I think it's important to note that Jay's uh, publicity agency also represents Matthew McConaughey, mm -hmm. who was on the cover of Esquire in fall of 2022. Just a couple, a few months right. before I got this, mm -hmm. uh, this assignment, and they don't even need to make a threat. It's just kind of understood. You burn one of our clients, we're going to revoke access to your to your others. I mean, that's just how, that's how it works. The celebrity yeah. media game works, and so you know, as far as editors know that, again, they need access in order for them to put out a magazine, in order for their publication to work. I mean, this is you know all stuff that's kind of hidden to the average viewer, but. Um, they will never know. So sorry, w would you? But you know, that's what I honestly, yeah. just to make about me again, um, <laughs> but that's what I love about doing this and that it is successful because I yeah. have such loyal listeners and people that come see my show is because like I've had people that, you know, maybe aren't comfortable talking like that on my show or don't want to share something or like we got to keep sure. it light because I'm, I am so, um, 
dependent on these powerful people putting me in their movies and their specials and this and that. Totally. <laughs> what I kind of love is when I realize like I've got nothing to fucking lose. Yeah. And it is so fun and freeing because I'm like, oh, was I up for something I didn't know about? And now this this episode's going to come out and they're going to be like, cut Heather McDonald. She's a bitch that talked about Jake Shetty. Good. It's not going to change my lifestyle. Yeah. But, you know, there is a yeah. calculus there. I mean, there yeah. have been times where I've interviewed someone mm -hmm. and they've said something interesting and they've asked me to not right. include it in the article. Right. I understand that part. And but I'm saying, I haven't yeah. included because right. I do that too. it did not seem worth it to tarnish their reputation. Right. right. Of course. This seemed worth it for me to yes. pursue. Okay. A hundred percent. Okay. So you hear this and you're like, what? Fuck that. I'm going to get the story out. What? <laughs> I mean, kind of. Yeah. You know, again- I don't have any exclusivity with Esquire. I'm right. a freelancer. I work on a project basis. So I told him, I was like, you know, I'm going to pursue this elsewhere. I hope you know that. And, you know, I am free to do that. Uh, and so- So was The Guardian the first place you went? No, I went to some other places. I- And where did some other people say, we don't want to touch this piece of shit? This, this got some stink on it that we're scared of? Yeah. And especially uh -huh. because Esquire had killed it, that kind of- Mm -hmm. tainted it in some people's eyes. And, you know, I understand why I swear I did it. I'm actually really kind of upset that this backstory has kind of been dragged into it. I love Esquire. Esquire was a magazine I grew up reading. I it was literally a dream come true the first time I wrote for Esquire. And to write for them, contribute to them frequently. I mean, that's all I wanted to be when I was a kid. I wanted to be a writer for Esquire. It, I adored that magazine and I still do. The only reason we have brought it up is that it because it became very aware, uh, very apparent that Jay's team was going to try to use that information to discredit me and discredit the story. So mm -hmm. we felt like we had no choice but to get ahead of it. And you know, when I went to Sam Wolfson, the editor at The Guardian, and I told him, I was like, look, this is a bizarre origin story behind this article that I'm looking into. And I tried to be very transparent with him. So you know, I didn't want it to be like this, but... It, Felt like our hand was forced. So what other things does your article reveal that you can share? So also as a part of Jay's backstory is that he claims that he moved to India mm -hmm. after he graduated. And we found uh, – and that he was in the ashram there. Ashram is the Sanskrit term for monastery essentially uh -huh. for this branch of Buddhism or this branch of Hinduism, excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, but we found a bunch of information – First person accounts from people who were in London who say, you know, Jay was not in India for that period of time. He spent the vast majority of his time in Watford, which is a town outside of London. Uh, he was at the ashram there. We found newsletters, kind of like. And, and would the reason to say I was in the monastery in Indian versus India versus the monastery in London is because it's just a more authentic. It sounds like more real or like he's less fancy or like why would you lie about because i think in the mind of white westerners who aren't familiar with that's Hinduism, what i'm saying it seems more real or something more special or right this idea that you were in the mountains of india uh you know studying these ancient spiritual texts Got it. is a very compelling narrative mm -hmm. right I mean, what's a more compelling narrative uh you know i wasn't interested in spiritualism I have this epiphany because of this one holy man comes to speak with me and then I follow him to India and learn from him for three years in an ashram in India. Or, yeah, I grew up in this religious organization. My family was part of it. And uh, I kind of came around when I was 18. And then joined the monastery outside of London. Yes. For a couple yes. of years. Yeah. The mon monastery, it's called Bhakti. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Now I see what you mean. Okay. It's called Bhakti Vedanta Manor. It was okay. actually gifted to the Hare Krishna faith by George Harrison. Got interested in the group. And then it. bought them a, a monastery right, to live in. Right, bought them this huge, sprawling property. mansion in this huge estate. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And kind of gifted it over to the church. So, uh, yeah. So there was that. Yeah. There was that. I'm trying to think what else. And then when the celebrity stuff came about, yeah. like he married J-Lo and Ben, right? Yes. He officiated their wedding. Yeah. And that's when I first started to hear about him was like when people were like, oh, Jay Shetty, Jake Shetty does is so great. And starting to see him at like, you know, 
being guests on podcasts and yeah. see. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. I, I didn't really know much either until this article. And then, of course, I was fascinated. Yeah, he was, you know, heavily pushed by Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, when Facebook was trying to make itself a competitor to YouTube, mm -hmm. it was paying people to create original content. And they would literally bring Jay on stage for, you know, industry events for, uh, you know, people – People who work in the media industry, who work in advertising, who work in publishing, mm -hmm. and uh, and also for other creators, and be like, look at Jay Shetty. He's earning millions of dollars on the platform. You could be like him if you worked with us. There were live events where they brought him on stage and kind of use him as you know this shining example of yeah. what can be done on Facebook. He was promoted by them. He was promoted by members of his own religious uh, community. So Jay was the head of the youth group. Within the Hari, Hari Krishna faith. When he was how old? Uh, I think when he was like 18. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, but he had incredible stature within there. And so what other people who talked to me anonymously for this article mm -hmm. told me is that when Jay decided he wanted to, you know, become a public persona and pursue this career as a media figure, he would have members of the youth group and just members of the religious organization just spamming people nonstop with his content. And that kind of initially kickstarted his rise to social media fame. Um, and then I found out a lot about the religious organization itself, which has, you know, I imagine you grew up in LA? Yes. Okay, so you remember the Hare Krishnas? Yeah, I feel like I used to see them. Yeah, why did yeah. they go away in their orange outfits? <laughs> Los Angeles made it illegal for them to panhandle at LAX. They're not allowed. There's an uh, ordinance that they're You know, not. They're like in the movie Airplane? Yeah, totally. They, they're yeah. featured in the movie Airplane. Totally. Yeah. I, younger viewers will probably have no idea what we're talking about. And so about. once they couldn't panhandle, they just left LA? No, they're still here. Oh. So the story of the Hare Krishna faith uh -huh. was in the late 60s, this old Indian man named Prabhupada wanted to bring this faith to the United States. Now, I want to be clear. I've talked to a lot of people from this faith, good, decent people who feel as though Jay and other people in it have kind of sold out their religious traditions, which are as legitimate as any other religion. They go back thousands of years. Um, and they feel like Jay has kind of sold out their religious traditions for material gain. So I'm not mm. against this group, it, you know, in general, but they do have a very... Uh, controversial past. So, Which is what? Well, so this guy comes, he converts all these hippies in the late 60s. In the 70s and 80s, they build communes all across the United States. Shave the head, wear the orange outfit. Right, shave the head, except for a small, like a small ponytail on the okay. back of the head, which is protect uh, a certain demon from sucking the soul out of the back of your head. Okay. So have you ever seen Pulp Fiction? Yeah, yeah. So you know how Ving Rhames' character oh, yeah, has yeah. a Band-Aid on the back oh, of his right. head? That's the implication is that, you know, from this kind of ancient Hindu idea oh. that someone has sucked his soul out and that's what's in the briefcase. Okay. So that's okay. why he needs to get the briefcase back so bad. Got it. Uh, just a fun little pop Hollywood culture. Hollywood moment, yeah. Yeah. In fact, so Prabhupada dies. He was an old Indian man. He passes away just from old age and it creates this kind of power vacuum within this organization that had grown to tens of thousands of members across the US. And again, these are all just white people who became enthralled with this man who was, you know, by every indication, he walked the walk, right? And he mm. was a legitimate holy man. He took this ancient uh, Hindu religion, introduced it to these people, converted them. And these people, I mean, they're hardcore. They, no caffeine, no meat, no sex outside of marriage for the specific purpose of procreation. I mean, it's a very orthodox hard okay. religion. You know, they slept on floors in these communes. They would wake up at 5.30 every day and, you know, sing and dance and chant for two hours straight. I mean, that was their big thing, right? They would be in public right. chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. So he dies, it creates this power vacuum, and then things got really dicey. So especially in the commune in West Virginia, in the hills of Appalachia, that was kind of their main one. And that was going to be this new religious center um you know, there were you know child sexual abuse corporal abuse of children within uh this faith a lot of these kids so these 
people that had converted, they ended up having kids and these kids are grown in faith. They're sent to boarding schools in India where they're beaten oh, by- Oh, God. Yeah. As young as five years old in some cases. They're beaten by their spiritual masters, you know, forced to have sex with them in some cases. Uh, girls married off to men twice their age. Um, and then on two occasions, there was conspiracy to commit murder conducted by- uh, <laughs> conducted by the church. So the one, uh, the man who would become the leader of the West Virginia commune, uh, a lot of people started questioning his authority because um, he was kind of a little emotionally, mentally unstable. And he ordered an assassination on two people, two other devotees within the faith who had been speaking out against him. One in West Virginia, and then one here in Los Angeles on Venice Boulevard in Culver City, like a mile and a half from where I live. It and what wild. year was this? This was in the 80s. Oh, uh, wow. So there's a great Peacock documentary about it. Okay. Something, uh, yeah, if you just Google Peacock, Hare Krishna, it's, it's called like Guru's Murder something. But. So Jay, but Jay just takes this as like, think like I'm on everyone, and he's on Ellen DeGeneres, and everyone's just like kind of loving that he's just taking the best parts yeah. of this. And you're able to incorporate it in your everyday life. Yeah. But he never identified that this is the specific religious organization that he came from. Jay would always just describe himself in these very kind of vague, generic terms. Like, oh, I'm a Hindu monk. There are literally thousands of different traditions within Hinduism. I mean, it's, you know, there are different denominations within Christianity. Right. But not that many. You yeah. Know, a lot of people would say even Hinduism is kind of a misnomer because these all these different traditions are so different from one another. H Hinduism is this incredibly broad, kind of overarching term. He never said he was from, you know, he grew up in, again, right. did not have the spiritual epiphany at 18. I mean, maybe he did have a spiritual epiphany when he was 18, but he always leaves out the part that he had been going to these events now, since he was 14. Is there anything in, in you finding what made him think to change his or origin story? Because it's actually pretty b brilliant until you get caught by a journalist. So like, you know, because I say that I feel like the biggest thing that's going on right now is, you know, there's such a backlash against the Nepo baby, which yeah. has existed forever sure. and in every industry, quite honestly, yeah. uh, honestly. But like, so then you'd find the Nepo babies now will try to say, I had to audition and my dad didn't know I was auditioning and I had to take the train and whatever. And it's like a flex of like, I was poor. And yeah. I've joked about that a lot. Like, just fucking, who doesn't matter? Like, it doesn't, you know. So do you think, like, was there anything you found that maybe he got the idea of why not to tell his story and why his story wasn't going to be compelling enough to pop? Only Jay can answer that question. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to hearing his answer, which yeah. he has not addressed this article publicly. In fact, I think... As we're recording this, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's giving a talk at South by Southwest, like literally right now. Uh huh. Um, interesting. And it'll be very interesting to see if he addresses this because it's been nearly two weeks now. And so, in wrapping up, like, is there anything else that we want to share besides everyone going to read this article for themselves and stuff? But like, what do you think is going to happen now? That's a good question, um, Jay. Jay's attorneys have been in touch with me and The Guardian. Uh, can't really elaborate much more than that, but suffice to say, I stand by my reporting. I think it's pretty rich with documentary evidence of everything we found. You know, We found Jay's old personal blog where he writes about his time in India, and he says that he was there for only four months before he moved back to, to London. So, so then that, that was the truth. The blog thing says four months. But other things say how long? Three years, right? He said he had moved there and was there for three years, but it had taken trips back. Okay. And now it appears that from the evidence we gathered, it would appear that the opposite was true, that he was in Watford for the majority of time and took a trip to India. Well, the only interview that I listened to, because I was into Jada Pinkett Smith and mm. her book and that whole thing, and you know, I always found her to just be completely self-absorbed, narcissistic, <laughs> her red table talk all about it and just is so just pompous and know it all. 
So then she writes the book, you know, and I read the book. And so I'm like, oh, let me listen to this interview. And they are just kissing each other's ass and they've been friends and he's been on the Red Table Talk and, you know, um, you know, just how close they are and stuff. But in listening, and I'm listening to this, and I was like, wait, is this guy a therapist? What is this? Oh, he's a spiritual advisor, whatever. And right. I'm what like, does that but mean? But he's never, he, in it, he never makes her take accountability for anything. He was completely on her side of her narrative about anything. Everything that she said was, you know, and she was mad at Will when, you know, Will wanted to throw her a birthday party and and as everyone should be, because then the birthday party would be about Will throwing it and not her. Like, and I'm like, how are you not just in a nice way being like, okay, but can't you see the other side? Nothing. Yeah. And that's when I was like, who is this guy? But I have listened to therapists be on personalities radio shows and they just want to be invited back and they so i mean and i believe there's therapists behind closed doors that tell the hollywood person what they want to hear because they're paying 500 dollars out of pocket and they don't want to lose that client yeah i mean you're not diagnosing cancer and then saying you don't have cancer you know that would so it's like it's a very gray line of like are you really doing your job or not because you're not going to tell this person that they're, you know, behaving poorly. Yeah. And there's, I have two responses to that. One is that Jay is very good at making people feel good about themselves, mm-hmm. both ordinary, everyday followers, people who know him through social media, and big, high profile celebrities. Mm-hmm. You know, he's uh, very, and you picked up on that. But also, with regards to Red Table Talk and all these people who, you know, lent Jay their platform, this is what happens when. Celebrities and influencers replace real journalists as kind of arbiters of information in our public discourse. And if there's any reason I pursued this so aggressively, it is because of that. You know, we're living through this misinformation age. It's only going to get worse through it with AI and this just tsunami of you know, misinformation that's bound to come with us. So, you know, if anybody takes away anything, it's just to be more thoughtful about where you get your information from. I I mean, I love that. Thank you so much. Thank Tell everybody me. where they can follow you. Yeah, uh, on Twitter, I'm just at McDermott, just my last name. And then on Instagram, I'm Johnny McD, J-O-H-N-N-Y underscore, underscore, M-C-D. It's long, <laughs> yeah. So now I would like to do a prediction of what I think will happen. Okay, you can predict whatever you want. I I, I, okay. I will uh, abstain. Well, you're going to be just fine in life and continue to to rock it. And I don't know what your goals are, but like maybe get into the documentary world, whatever. Um, with him, I think it it won't really like nothing will really change for a minute, but it will be a different popularity or lack thereof. In by by spring of twenty five, okay. it's going to take a minute, and people are not going to want to open their eyes to it. But I I think some people will still stick around. Yeah, but I don't think he'll gain a lot of new people. Some people won't leave. He'll they'll still listen to his show. He's so big that it will be okay. It's not going to like completely yeah. go away. But it's just because I've seen this happen with other Mm. mommy type people and everyone loves them. And then they reveal it. Like, I can't remember the woman's name right now, but the one that did the video and she just got her eyebrows done and she's like got pissed at some comment and was like Rachel Hollis. Yes, Rachel Hollis. And yeah, she definitely she's still around traffics in in a similar circles as Jay. Exactly. And she was and, you know, she was someone that had. Again, very similar to the story. Didn't really have any real credentials to it. Was a privileged white girl that got a job at like Disney or whatever. Met her husband. Um, you yeah, know, her they, husband was a hotshot Disney executive. They yeah. got divorced, and he has since yeah, he left passed away, the yeah. earth. He was sick with something, I think. Or did he end his life? I thought he had a pretty serious 
an addiction problem, which oh, it was again, addiction. It was addiction. Yeah, which again, uh, you know, they put on this face of having this of health, elite, and, yeah. and they had a whole thing totally. of how to make your marriage work, totally. and then they got and divorced. They were, and but and but not to demonize what happened. He was battling demons, right. just like every, everybody right. else. And you does, can that's you know? fine, yeah. But when she did that video of, um, yeah, I'm not regular. Of course, I'm not regular. I do this and this. Didn't and she compare herself to Harriet Tubman or something? Yeah, yes. yeah. She said Harriet Tubman. And it was yeah. like, and I believe she still has a podcast. I'm sure she's still making money. Yeah. But before that video, she was doing the tours, the three-day Tony Robbins type yeah. of events for thousands of dollars and thousands of people and merch. And she had like a huge staff and she and her husband da, 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 and then that happened they got divorced and and like i said i think she's still doing her thing to an extent but it'll never be what it was and yeah. that's kind of what i predict this to be well we'll see you know i'm continuing to report on this there was a lot of information that i'm sure came your way after. totally that didn't make it into the article before and a lot of information that I've received since. So, so do you think you'll do a, a follow up article? Yeah, I, I think I'll do it well. Yeah. Okay. Well, anything, any more stuff you want to come or when it comes out, let's have you back. Yeah, I'd love and that. And discuss this that, is great. and that'll be great. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Remember, you go to heathermcdonald.net for all my cute merch, all my dates. I'll be at Palm Beach uh, this weekend, like I said, on Friday and Saturday. Everything is there and. You also can join my Patreon there, heathermcdonald.net. Only go to heathermcdonald.net for all of my tickets. Okay, thank you.